Well, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, my name is David Johnson. I'm the Telemedicine Program Coordinator for the Fort Drum Regional Health Planning Organization. I'm joined uh, this afternoon by uh, Corey Zeigler. Uh, he's our Chief Information Officer. And um, welcome to this month's Telehealth Learning Collaborative. I did a little uh, checking and it looks like uh, we've been doing this now for just about a year and a half. Uh, our first meeting was in August of 2014. And um, we've certainly grown since then. A lot of things have happened since then. We're happy to have everyone on the, on the call. Uh, just a few logistics. Uh, we are using GoToWebinars here for the first time. Uh, we used GoToMeeting before. So I think everybody is muted at this point. If you have a question or a comment, um, there's a button you can click to raise your hand. That is um, right under the attendees section. Um, you can raise your hand there for a question. Uh, you can also list questions in the questions section um, of your dashboard. Thank you for that. Um, I am recording the session today. Um, as we usually do, uh, so appreciate your attention to that. Uh, there's a number of things we want to talk about today. Um, just keep in mind that you will be recorded. First up, uh, I want to uh, mention the number of people that are on the call today. Um, there's a number of folks from different areas and we're actually joined uh, this afternoon by folks uh, live from Minneapolis, Minnesota at the ATA conference. Um, Andrew, are you, uh, are you there? Andrew. I see that somebody named Andrew is there. I think you can hear me now, can you? Hey, there you are. Hey, Andrew. Um, and you, you have a group of people there at the ATA conference with you, don't you? Yes, I'm joined here with, uh, with Toya, May Kong from TCHP, and then Danielle Mowler. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys, for joining today. It's a special honor to have um, representatives from uh, the American Telemedicine Association, Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, um, the Connect, uh, Center for Connected Health. I appreciate uh, you guys being on the call today. Um, Rayanne Aguilera uh, from the uh, State uh, Department of Health uh, was uh, sick today. She actually called in sick. Um, and so uh, her part of the agenda, we're going to move toward um, next month. Uh, we were going to talk about the State Health Innovation Plan and um, uh, telemedicine initiatives around that. But we're going to put that back to the next meeting uh, that comes in, in about a month. Um, one of the big things that we want to talk about today, though, of course, is the news that we just learned about uh, really last week, um, Excellus's uh, policy statement. And so we want to talk about that a little bit. I thought for context, for the purpose of context, I would just share some background. Um, and so let me see if I can get to this slide. Uh, this again, you've, many of you have seen this slide before. This is a look at just our kind of section of New York State. So the upper northern central part of New York State is where we're predominantly operating. Um, and so for our uh, little project here, we have uh, on our uh, fiber network, we have about 102 different sites that are connected there. And uh, this is just a snapshot of what uh, has happened in our area as it relates to Excellus. We have a current, uh, number of current projects surrounding telemedicine. Um, and again, in 2014, uh, we tracked a, a total of 40 patient encounters. So that was our initial start. There were some that were happening before then, but uh, this is really just the beginning of uh, what we were able to track. Uh, 2015, we tracked a total of 315 uh, patient encounters. And then uh, year to date, we've uh, tracked 264. Uh, so halfway through the year, we've almost reached where we were last year total. 
uh, making pretty good progress, a total now of 619 patient encounters. But it's a small, small beginning, and certainly there's folks from the Finger Lakes, uh, from the University of Rochester Medical Center, from Rochester Regional General, uh, Westchester Medical on the call today, and they've, they've done a fair amount. This, so again, this is just our snapshot. Um, here's some of the survey questions that we ask people as they're doing uh, telemedicine. Uh, one of the questions is, who is the payer for this visit? And you can see it's kind of spread out amongst different providers like uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and then you see there about 30% of our uh, tracked encounters have been private insurance. Of those, um, about 70% of them, almost 70% of them, have been Excellus uh, that, uh, that was actually the payer on those telemedicine visits. So it's, it's fairly substantial for us um, what Excellus uh, does and what it says. They really have been a, a leader for us in a a great um, partner in telemedicine. Uh, again, here's kind of the numbers. So here's the, uh, here's the statement that we received from Excellus. Um, and you can kind of read that. I won't read that out loud, but the gist of it is um, they are now going to um, cover all telemedicine visits, but only reimburse at 50% of the rate payable when services are performed on a face-to-face -face basis. So there's kind of the news. Um, Andrew uh, from the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center gave me this great article from uh, uh, Nathaniel Lachtman, who's a partner with um, a law firm. Here's his quote, and I think it kind of says it really well. Um, the take on where we're at with this, you can see that there's a distinction between um, what's called coverage parity and payment parity. And so it appears that um, Excellus understands that they are covering uh, telemedicine, they're covering telemedicine visits, but they're not required uh, by the legislation to pay at the same rate. Uh, as Nathaniel Lackman says, the result, a telehealth payment statute that's largely useless. <laughs> um, it effectively kills um, the incentive for specialists to be a part of uh, what we're doing. So that's unfortunate, um, but uh, we're continuing to uh, talk with Excellus, continuing to work with them. Uh, other insurance companies, and um, uh, kind of the purpose of today's call is to get some feedback on this and uh, begin to talk about where do we go from here. Uh, just, uh, you know, some initial thoughts on that. Uh, we know that Excellus' uh, policy goes into effect August 1st, uh, so we have a little window of time to respond. And uh, we'd like to put together uh, a, a letter to both Excellus and uh, to Senator Young and Assemblywoman Russell, who sponsored the uh, New York parity law. So I'm going to kind of open it up at this point and see if anybody has thoughts, comments, questions. I'm unmuting lines right now. I think if you do a mute all and then an unmute. Mm -hmm. oh, no, it's ready back. Okay, I just muted everybody again. I'm sorry. That's my fault. <laughs> Hi, David. This is Joey Horton. I might have missed this, hey, but Joey. has Excellus responded to you or um, provided feedback on this? In regards to the letter that you sent out? Yeah, actually, um, Corey and I were able to talk with Dr. Mary Beth McCall this morning a little bit. Um, and, you know, she did kind of indicate that here's where they stand right now. Uh, but again, mentioned that there's this window of opportunity to uh, provide feedback to them. Uh, we're going to be sharing 
kind of some of the data that we uh, I just shared with all of you about that. And uh, this is kind of where they're at right now. They they definitely see that the legislation allows them to uh, take this this position. Okay. Yeah. I think advocacy really needs to happen. A larger, the more people that voice their concerns, the better. So our. Oh, he did. Go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, Actually, can you uh, can you speak up a little bit, Danielle? We can't hear you very well. Closer to the mic. Um, so I guess my question was, in, in your quick conversation, has there been any kind of specific data released? Are they worried about you know a, a large increase in the number of claims, or do they have data that specifies that this fifty percent is is rational or data that that sort of pressed the uh, decision? Yeah, Corey, maybe you could just talk about that conversation we had with. Sure. So I, I don't uh, definitely want to don't want to speak for Excellus, um, but I can kind of uh, summarize our take on uh, our conversation with uh, Dr. McCall. Basically, they they looked at um, the administrative cost of of these codes um, in the using the RVU or the uh, relative value units, and determined that. Uh, by their estimate, there's about half the cost of providing uh, these same services through telemedicine versus uh, actually having the patient present uh, in their office. Um, and I, so we posed the question, um, you know, what about the cost of the infrastructure and some of the other requirements? Um, and I, I think that they're counting on the fact that telemedicine largely has been grant funded, um, and a lot of this infrastructure is in place, but. As we try and become self-sustaining, um, you know somebody's got to continue to pay for you know the infrastructure that's in place. So um, you know we we kind of addressed both sides, but I think it basically came down to um, they were allowed to go through this assessment um, based on the language uh, because there is no payment parity, just a coverage parity, um, and are concerned one because they don't know. How much uh, of an increase in the claims that are going to take place? Um, they wanted to basically head that off so that they can start to ramp it up once they have a better understanding of what kind of volume they're going to get because of the parity law. Um, but if I did share with her that you know, and David did as well, that you know they definitely uh, disincentivizes anyone from leveraging telemedicine to uh, provide both access to care where we don't have it at all, or requiring the uh, the patients to travel to receive the those uh, you know those services. You sure did. Um, so I and this is just an example, and maybe we can help provide. We certainly have a, a lot of expertise here in the room that might be able to compile some additional information as you guys move forward, putting together that letter, et cetera. But I was at a session this morning around building sustainable telepsychiatry programs. And for example, their um, estimated number of claims was 300,000 over the course of a year. And this is a large provider. It's, um, they actually got 30,000 claims. So you know, there's a lot of data out there from real programs that would be potentially helpful to you all um, you know, to compile some of that. That seems like it would be helpful. Yeah, that would be great. And, and Dr. McCall actually requested um, uh, one a presentation that, that uh, David and others had done prior. Um, you know, and uh, you know, data like that would be helpful for them. I think. Um, you know, I I got the sense from Dr. McCall that they they wanted, or at least she wanted to um, partner with us to make sure that you know this type of decision is an informed decision. Um, and you know, we talked about. The ability of telemedicine to mitigate some long-term costs or some costs of care that you know the, as the patient becomes a, a exacerbated or, a, or is forced through a more acute uh, type of scenario, um, that you know we can mitigate those costs with telemedicine. So I, I think as much as we can make this business case for them, um, maybe adjust some of this language uh, prior to August 1st, the better. Okay. 
this is a Latoya from ATA. So um, your initial slides pointed out Excellus was already covering for telehealth about 70 percent of um, the claims, at least to your, pa your, your patients, were Excellus. Um, and I believe their billing manual had limitations on patient settings and uh, certain ENM and other service codes. Um, the statute that we currently have in the state has limitations on where patients can be. So I'm, you know, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you've had this wonderful conversation with Excel as to what their rationale is and what their thinking was. I don't think there was a thought process when they came to this. Um, it would be interesting to hear how they currently see the statute, which really isn't a far stretch from what they're currently doing, as a justification for the 50% change. I mean, some of the same policies and statutes are be captured under their existing manual. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, weren't able to dig down into that level, uh, but we did offer to um, to talk to some of their uh, contractors, um, and uh, you know, to to get down to that level of detail of, of some of the rationale. You know, Dr. McCall gave us kind of a high level uh, overview, but I think if we got our ducks in a row and and were able to do some presentations um, to their um, you know, because they, they're beholden to a lot of these subcontractors that are actually uh, uh, supporting or implementing the, their their plans. Um, you know, those are the folks that I think that we need to uh, convince, you know, that this is a, a move against, you know, they're basically shooting themselves in the foot because the costs are going to be greater downstream. I see there's a question here from uh, Terry Yonker from the Finger Lakes Health Center. Uh, she asks about uh, does the Excellus policy cover uh, blue choice options? Um, actually, I can kind of show you, I believe, what it looks like, their statement. Uh, hold on just a second. And uh, I'll definitely attach this to the follow-up, uh, but uh, let's see if you can see this on the screen. Here's the, uh, here's the letter we received. And you can see in terms of coverage, right, they are saying here mandate applies to all programs. So I'm thinking blue choice option falls in somewhere, somewhere in here, right? Is the blue choice, a, somebody help me out with this, is that a Medicare advantage? Because they did, they have to exempt that because Medicare uh, requires that it be covered. So they weren't able to uh, address the Medicare. Terry, do you, do you know that? I've unmuted your line. Uh, I think Medicare advantage is for geriatric patients, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, but I don't know what the, the all the names of the Medicare Advantage plans are. That That blue choice isn't one of them, is it? Uh, no, I'm, I think this blue choice option would be similar to, um, well, not really Child Health Plus because it does cover adults, but for, it's for low income. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, was I believe that. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you think it's covered? It's, it's the same thing? Yeah, I, yeah, it falls under this. And here, here's where the kind of the, the uh, glitch was, um, it's this little bullet point uh, at the bottom of the first page. Um, that's where they said they'll do the 50 percent. I was just going to Yep. Go ahead. I was just going to post, I just posted another question, I didn't finish it. Um, you know, we at Figure Lakes, I do the clinical care coordination for all our patients accessing specialties from primary care office. Um, we have some great clinical outcomes, particularly with our Hep C program, HIV program, teledental. Um, that far outweigh anything patients were getting face to face. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, share that data or go through Mary and Serene, however you want to do it. But um, to me, it's it's pretty um, obvious how successful telemedicine has been working from a patient-centered medical home, particularly an FQHC where we have a full team uh, devoted to the care and access of patient access to care for patients. Yeah, that'd be great data to have, Terry. And I've seen, you know, many of your presentations before, and it's just, it, that's really good data to share with them. 
So the Hep C program well, is new, and uh, you know we have patients completing treatment, being evaluated, starting medication, completing treatment that never ever would have gotten treatment in the local community. Now, what would you say, you know, given some of those cases, the final outcome would have been um, from a payer perspective? Like, do you, the, the ideal situation would be able to say to them that, you know, this had it uh, progressed without that early care provided with telemedicine, it would have, this is likely to become the outcome. Um, do, do you have any sense of that data? I know that's hard to project. Well, I think the standards of care say that pe people with hep C need to be treated in order to prevent liver cancer and um, cirrhosis, which are the leading cause of transplant of liver transplants and death. So I guess you have to look at you know 20 years down the road when these younger people um, have more severe disease. I mean, I wouldn't imagine that the cost of the treatment is very expensive. You're talking a thousand dollar a pill for daily for 12 weeks. Um, so, and the insurance companies are approving that, so that I think they know the long-term benefits in terms of saving money, same with HIV. I mean, the governor has, has said that we need to do more HIV screening so we can get people into early care because we know long-term it's going to cost the health system huge amounts of money. I'm not a policy person. You'll have to bring somebody on board that can speak to those numbers. But what I've what I've read in my clinical journals, you know, and gone to various conferences on HIV and Hep C, um, that's been what we've been told. Right. Yep. How about some insight from the um, some from the folks uh, at uh, DOH, um, or maybe I see that Wade Abbott, um, you're on the line as well. Our sense was that this certainly wasn't what um, Senator Young or Assemblywoman Russell anticipated. Thoughts out there? Somebody's going to grab that one. <laughs> Apparently not. Wait, are you on the line? Hey, this is Maybe not. from ATA. Can I jump in while we're waiting for our folks at Sure. So, so yeah, please. One of the things I noticed about the letter, and I just want to bring this up for discussion, is um, page two, which are telephonic codes. Uh, does that have any bearing on their decision here? And, and to what extent did they cover these codes before they, they released this notice? Yeah, I had a little trouble hearing you. Could, do you mind repeating that question and just speaking up a little? Sure, the, the telephonic code, the, the thing that you're covering now. Yeah, I, I don't know how that plays in. I know that uh, Dr. McCall did mention it this morning. Um, but uh, I don't know how that relates to the legislation because I, I think the legislation, you know, distinguishes between um, these telephonic codes and, um, you know, live synchronous video consultations. So I don't, I don't know. David, this is Andrew. Did she, did she join a learning collaborative call fairly you mentioned they were going to begin reimbursing for these codes, and maybe is this uh, they've combined this announcement? I thought a couple of months ago she mentioned they were adding the telephonic codes, and we're going to begin reimbursing for those as a new thing. Yeah, these so these on as you can see on that page, these are those telephonic codes. Um, so that's not it's not really related to the legislation though. Um, unless maybe they're thinking, oh, we're doing more. Um, I don't, I don't know how it relates. Right, and the, the other thing, so um, Patty, you can probably hear us in the background. They also have the 994 online email code. That's a that's a video code. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the 994. I don't know. So I guess the conversation is. My thought here is is that do they do they really understand one the statute's definition of telemedicine and telehealth? Do they understand what they were doing before they released this notice um, and what some of that claims data is? Um, and moving forward, what some of these changes are going to, how they're going to impact your your, your population? Um, 
population. I don't think that they really, as they're as they're trying to figure out telemedicine and their benefit design, I don't think they know what it is uh, because some of these codes are a mix of, of phone, they're a mix of mobile, and and they've kind of jumbled it all together and they've included modifiers and I don't understand how they, I don't think that they understand how they're integrating telemedicine and benefit design. It, it, it appears that's the case, um, for sure. And David, just so you know, uh, Cindy Gordon joins us here in Minneapolis. I'm sorry, Andrew, what was that? I just wanted to update you that Cindy Gordon from Rochester Regional joined us here in the room as well. Oh, great. Hey, Cindy, great to have you. So um, I know, Cindy, you were aware of this um, before us, actually, um, this decision from Excellus. Um, what, do you think, what do you think the impact is going to be at your end? Well, um, it's concerning because we're looking to expand services for our skilled nursing facilities. And, and those services are going to be specialist. So one of the first things the specialist said to, that said to me, of course, I'm going to get paid the same. And a couple of weeks ago, before this letter came out, I said, absolutely. I mean, we always have the Medicare issue, you know, but uh, now we have this. So um, we, I do know that our counselor, our legal counselor, our system, and our high-level executives that do a lot of the negotiating with the, uh, the, the payer have reached out to uh, the CEO and whatnot to have these discussions, ask, you know, really what, let them know how this is going to impact providing care to patients. So we're hoping they're going to relook at this. Um, I, I think what's happened is uh, Excellus locally has contracted with MD Live <clears throat> to do yep. uh, virtual visits, direct to consumers. So th I think this is a, a direct off to that. I think that they think this is the doctors are going to get paid $49 per, per, per visit for direct to consumer that, that, that all physicians are providing consults will get paid basically the same thing and they're going to cut it in half and we really do believe that's where this has come from and it's really not fair because most of the physicians that are going to be providing consults for us are our own doctors that are in the, the bricks and mortar and they're going to be seeing patients in their regular workflow and it's and one patient's going to be a virtual visit and then they're going to have a patient in the examination room so they still have all that infrastructure that they're having to support therefore they should be getting reimbursed the same that's where I think this came from. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that seems to make sense. Um, you know, one of the things that when Dr. McCall was on our learning collaborative a while back, she really kind of focused on the direct to patient uh, model um, and, you know, mentioned how that's going to be a big factor. So, um, certainly, direct to patient, the cost would be, uh, you know, substantially you know, lower uh, for a provider. Uh, well, and, if that's all they do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a reason why those direct to consumer, direct to patient models are cheaper is because they have a very small subset of things that they're able to diagnose and treat. It's the very low intensity, but you can't generalize across the very wide array of potential diagnoses, et cetera, and say that you know that you can complete any type of assessment treatment plan in 15 minutes. So, right. Yeah. Yep. So, David, what do you, what's that, uh, Cindy? I'm sorry. I was I was just in one of the concurrent sessions prior to coming here, and one of the uh, physicians that was speaking from um, Mercy Hospital, from their system, said that a lot of the direct to consumer um, programs are being underwritten by the uh, Wall Street. And really, these visits are costing $200, not $49, and that's why they can afford to do what they're doing. And that's just right. what I just So how long can that be sustainable? Why is Wall Street underwriting it? Yep. What were you going to say, Cor? Well, I was, I was thinking that um, did you have some thoughts, or, or maybe folks uh, on the call have some thoughts about um, kind of framing this um, as a response because I think initially before we even get a seat at the table to talk to um, talk to them and um, 
you know, we'll probably have some sort of communication that needs to go back to them. Yep. And that's well, uh, that's well thought out. Now, does you have folks on from the ATA? Are there some templates that we could use that have been successful, maybe in other state advocacy, um, that maybe we could start with that would help us? Well, yeah, Latoya, can you yeah, if speak I to that? To this, I did New York and A for you idiots here. <laughs> but, 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 so, so there are no templates. I think that this is really kind of um, a set of precedent here. But I think Danielle makes a really good point of um, trying to survey um, your hospitals, particularly whether it's Rochester, um, the Finger Lakes as a, as a next year community, those that are providing specialty services um, are the ones that you really need to work from. Um, because they're providing more higher acute services and you will be more severely impacted by that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 and, and at this point, um, relaying this information to um, Senators Russell and Assemblywoman Young um, about how you know, you're going to lose access to services um, if they're going to be paid more um, and, and trying to come up with some kind of, or convincing them to legislate more um, if you can one of those constituents to talk about the impact that it's going to have on their specialty services. I'm thinking stroke, uh, I'm thinking cardiovascular services, care, um, mental health specifically. I don't know if you guys know your, your thing. I do. That conversation with your with the legislative members really needs to happen. You really need to clarify with them what they, their legislative intent was in these bills. And if it wasn't this, that they need to be involved in this discussion now. Okay. And you probably didn't have a lot of time. I think they said it was July 1st. August, August 1st. So there's not a lot of time. And I think the New York session is ending soon. I can't remember offhand. We're already into May. Can you guys hear May OK? <laughs> yep, we yeah. can. OK. You're, you're into May, so you can get that going to be done like soon. Yeah. You need to have that conversation yeah. right away. So I guess what I'd like to suggest is that um, you know we take a, a smaller group, uh, some of our kind of founding partners at the Finger Lakes and um, uh, Cindy, of course, and kind of work on um, maybe a draft, uh, draft letter, and then um, you know, we can bring that to the group as a whole. Uh, maybe in a special session of our of our group here, instead of yeah. waiting until next month. I also think you should have in your back pocket for both Russell's staff some model language. Uh, I'm I'm thinking that words like comparable reimbursement aren't even going to go well. Like I think that Excel is still going to be able to find a loophole with like comparable reimbursement. Like I think that you're going to want something that that's Going to meet your service level, but isn't going to pay for folks because they want the accommodation to develop whatever contract they have with the hotel. So I think you're going to have like perfect language already. Minnesota's Minnesota's pretty good. Quite honestly, I'm not sure your letter is going to have any your data is going to have any impact on Ellis. Where they may back off on it is if you put the political pressure on them, mm -hmm. and you get them to delay it, and that gives your legislative members time to like introduce the bill mm -hmm. to like get that type of model language. Yeah, that's right. That might be your best strategy to do this. You, you involve your legislative members and Russell to, uh, to make sure that their intent was not cut like this. You have them speak for themselves to get them to delay this Thank you. Um, so maybe somebody else in the legislature time to introduce legislative language. So then you get a statutory. Yeah. Right now, right now, probably your best tactic is just to delay Excel because I think even with the data that you give them, they decided they want to go forward with this policy. Mm -hmm. That would be my guess. It's because it's it's all. So I'm having a little trouble, um, you know, there's a little background there, there, a little trouble hearing what you're saying, but I, I think what I heard you say was um, maybe having our legislators involved early on, um, and putting, getting, getting them involved in the conversation early on. Is that yeah. essentially what you said? Yes, I think probably the best part is 
a delay this and not have it by August 1st. And if you can get it delayed, in my opinion, the legislators time enough to actually introduce it and get it passed so you can prevent this statutorily from happening or not as drastic. So what I what I heard was that it was really to get get a delay, um, so that we have time to, um, you know, actually dig into this, and then, and work to provide more data. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just to ask for a stay of execution on this. So get the the uh, uh, our representatives involved just to get that delayed, so that we have time to work through this. Yep. You have a sense. Um, whether I'm Senator sorry. Go ahead. I can't hear us now. <laughs> no, go go ahead. We can hear you. Just you speak very whether, clearly. Whether Senator Young and Senator Russell are in the room and what their response? We haven't heard from them, right? We have not heard from them yet. Um, so Wade, uh, are are you there, Wade? I wonder if. Uh, um, hey, Wade. There you go. Yes. I wonder if you could, you know, help us make contact there with um, Assemblyman Russell or uh, Senator Young. Well, uh, neither is is on the Rural Resources Commission any anymore. Um, but certainly, um, you know, like I would advise to anybody is is. Uh, Contact information for their offices, both within uh, within district and within the uh, in Albany, should be listed on the, uh, the Senate website. Um, so you should be able to get a hold of any any member that you need to. Um, I will say that I'm not tremendously personally well versed in the and I'm not involved heavily with the legislative end of things here for the the rural Re rural resources commission. Uh, but I will um, make sure I pass along these concerns as I hear them to uh, the folks that are. Appreciate that, Wayne. Thank you. That's good. Mm -hmm. other, uh, other thoughts about w how we should move forward? <clears throat> this is Cindy, and I think that uh, we just need to go to the website, pick up the phone, and ask who the staff member was that we could email. Better to young, assembly with Russell, and that will run with anything else. You just have the conversation, take the next steps. And I've, I've done this before with Louise Slaughter for things. You just have members, and they just uh, respond, and they get you what you need. They they probably don't even know what's happening. That that could be the case. That I think that be. is the case. Yeah. Don't have to put this. So why would you know? So I'll I'll uh, I'll take that on. Um, kind of representing. Uh, this learning collaborative, and um, appreciate your support around that. I'll bring back to you and report back to you what uh, what I'm able to find out. Uh, if it uh, if it means you know again uh, calling a special session of our collaborative, um, you know, hopefully you can join. It sounded like somebody else was trying to make a comment there. No, nope, maybe not. Just background. When is that? Other questions, thoughts. Well, let's let's uh, leave this uh, where it stands at this point. Um, also, wanted to talk very briefly about um, OMH and their proposed rulemaking. So um, they have withdrawn uh, the. Rulemaking that we talked about last month. Uh, they're working on um, updating that language, and so again, we have opportunity to um, uh, respond to them and provide some feedback. And there's a small group of people that responded to uh, a survey that we created uh, who wanted to participate in, in crafting a response to that as well. Uh, so we have a meeting scheduled. Uh, in the next couple of weeks to reply to that. Understand though that um, uh, there's a, a time frame. Um, so when those uh, new rules come out, we have another 90 days to respond. Um, so 
there'll be a there'll be a kind of a gap in time. So to a certain extent, we've put that on the shelf, um, put that on pause for the moment until they reissue that proposed rulemaking. Uh, again, one of the key issues there is uh, where providers are located and um, also the idea of uh, Article 28 facilities working with Article 31 um, OMH facilities. Any thoughts or questions about that um, little update? Okay. Uh, we have you know time on the agenda, so if there are other issues you want to raise, please uh, please raise your hand or fire away. I can hear Judy typing. <laughs> All right, I'm not hearing any questions. So with that, I want to thank you again. A special thanks to uh, uh, folks at the American Telemedicine Association, Telemedicine Association uh, the Center for Connected Health. Appreciate that. Volunteers to work with draft letters. Yeah, if, um, so I do have some uh, volunteers for the OMH uh, draft reg regulations. If you want to uh, participate in that, please contact me. Um, you have my contact information on the uh, meeting invite. Also, uh, if uh, you want to help me work with Senator Young and Assemblywoman Russell, um, please just you know reach out. Let me know. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for participating today. We'll uh, see you next month or next month's meeting is scheduled for June 20th at 2 o'clock. So thanks again, guys. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.